Okay, so scanning technique. The thing you'll find uh, most people referring to as like a screening exam involves using your probe in a longitudinal orientation and uh, often starting up by the clavicles. You can start lower, but a lot of people like to start by the clavicles as one limit of the chest and then drop their probe down until they hit the diaphragm, the solid organ, and say, okay, now that's where I stop. And so people will often start at the clavicle, drop down to one side. They'll go uh, as high as they can in the axilla then uh, from a mid-axillary approach, and again, drop down to the diaphragm. And then they'll just repeat that on the other side of the body. So people will usually access the front of the patient first. Sometimes they access the back first. Uh, and the idea is like you're going to do all of the front both sides and you're going to switch to the back, do all of the back both sides. And when you switch to the back, imagine now we're approaching the, the patient uh, with the probe from uh, the posterior aspect. Again, starting up at the highest level you can on the chest and going down until you feel like you've accessed as much of the lung as you can. Now, an approach like this, you have to keep in mind, uh, is a screening exam that doesn't access every part of the chest. So if we do these kinds of three-zone approach, then this is sort of like the CT-based equivalent areas you're accessing, with the red indicating the areas that you aren't. And so people are in two camps. There are those that say, if I have a pneumonia that I care about, that I want to treat with antibiotics, I think it's going to come into view, the blue parts of the beam, with my scanning technique, uh, doing the screening exam. And I think that things that uh, I miss are going to be small enough that maybe I don't need to treat them. And there's going to be the other camp that says, I want to access these red parts as much as possible in order to have my test perform the best. So a kind of hybrid that I do um, is to keep my probe in a linear orientation. I don't go in and transverse, but I view it as like a, a kind of lawnmower uh, technique for covering more of the chest. So I don't know why I would just do a mid-clavicular line and a mid-axillary line once you get to the point that your brain can process what's on the screen quickly and you can watch that those A lines on the lawn go by quickly, then I can scan like this quickly down to the bottom back up to the top, but a centimeter removed, back down to the bottom, a centimeter over, back up to the top, a centimeter over. So using this kind of approach, I'm going to decrease those red areas in the um, uh, prior uh, slide that we showed, the missed areas if you just take a three-view hemithorax approach. And another thing to keep in mind in scanning technique is the front is a lot easier than the back because kids do this when they feel cold gel on their back and it pulls their scapula over to block a lot of the posterior chest. So the uh, way that I like to engage uh, families in scanning the most, I like to start at the front because I like to show kids the screen of the ultrasound machine um, and have them sort of get engaged in that way. Maybe just close the door. Thanks, David. So to do so, you've got to do something that involves isolating their hands. This is my daughter, Matilda, being a, a great model. And to scan at the back, uh, you've got to do something that lets them feel comfortable, often them holding on to the parent. Uh, you know, Matilda trusts me, so she's just keeping her arms where we tell her to keep them. Uh, often the parent will need to not have their hands underneath the child, but to be holding those arms up and out to the side. I find if you do that approach first, the kid often like loses it because they haven't had a chance to see the screen. If they're older, you can do this. You can start at the back first and have them engaged in watching the screen with you. Uh, but the toddlers usually um, uh, will need to feel that parental reassurance uh, by being held. So some tips about the posterior view. People struggle with it a lot and a bunch of what they struggle with is they get an image when they're scanning at the back in between the uh, spine and the scapula that looks like this image. Um, there's not really a clear pleura. It looks like maybe what I'm seeing is disrupted, shredded pleura, but it's all really just artifact from not having your beam hit the pleura at a perpendicular angle. So images like this at the posterior part of the patient are often a probe misalignment issue. And that if you just manage to turn your probe 
so that you're really intersecting the pleura, you'll get A lines again. And this is the exact same patient just with the probe realigned to tease out that uh, sharp uh, pleura that you can now see really exists because your probe hits the pleura at a perpendicular angle. So an example, same idea. When you're scanning at the back, people often keep their probe aligned, like I'm putting it longitudinally on the skin and it's hitting the skin perpendicularly. But underneath the skin, you've got the curvature of the lung. And so if you keep the probe angled in a direct kind of PA view, you'll have a view that looks like this. If you then turn your probe a little bit obliquely, that's when you get it sharpening up because you're trying to intersect this angle of the chest perpendicularly, not the skin. So just keep that in mind. You go to the back. Oh, it doesn't look very sharp. Obliquely turn your probe a little bit laterally towards the patient. Kind of shoot from their back towards the point of their shoulder, let's say. Okay, and then what we'll see in normal lung, we've gone over before in these talks. Uh, the first thing that the beam hits uh, after going through the skin and the uh, intercostal muscles is the pleura, and that just causes reverberation back to the probe, and you get these artifacts, uh, mainly called A-lines. So how does that work? Well, it's a ping pong, as Nir just said, idea. So the probe sends out uh, a pressure wave. It goes down, it hits the bright pleura, and it bounces back up to the probe. And all the machine's doing is sending out that wave, then shutting off and waiting for stuff to re-vibrate the probe face. And it does very simple math. Time equals distance. So it says, okay, it went out this amount of time, but that means I'm seeing something here, this distance from the probe face. But what if then, while the machine is still shut off and waiting, so here we've got the true item uh, demonstrated with the true depth, what if it bounces back, it hits the probe face again, bounces back to the pleura and bounces back? Now the machine says, okay, I sent out a wave and I waited. And when I was waiting, there was this amount of distance, i.e. this amount of time covered. Oh, there must be something down here also. And it's just going to keep doing that for every um, uh, trip that the beam makes back and forth between the probe and the pleura. So that will produce the A lines. You'll notice, of course, there's a bunch of other little A prime lines within here. That's the same concept. It's just the reverberation's not happening between the pleura and the probe face. It's happening between any of these other hyperechoic uh, lines in the connective tissue deep to the skin. Okay, so we get A lines out of the way so that we can talk about B lines. So here's a uh, image showing a whole bunch of B lines, these uh, headlight or spotlight artifacts that shoot down all the way from the pleura to the end of the screen. So what's going on there? Okay, what's going on here is that you have wet pleura. So you've got a subpleural liquid bubble. So now the beam can enter that bubble and it's the same concept of ping-ponging, only the ping-ponging happens within the bubble. So the beam goes in, it bounces back to the surface of the pleura, it's redirected back to the bottom of the bubble, and then it escapes. And that's gonna give you the first one of these lines. And now it's just simple math of saying, we can say that that happens any number of times within the bubble. It can happen once, it can happen twice, it can happen three times. And every one of those infinite reverberations before it's released is another one of these tightly packed lines in this headlight kind of artifact. <laughs>